on, keep it on. Now you can start it. Did you start it yet? Yes, sir. Did we talk about gene flow yesterday? Yes, sir. Gene flow is a way that the numbers can change. Do y'all remember if the Hardy-Weinberg numbers change, that means the population has evolved. And so if an organism from another population comes in, that can change the Hardy-Weinberg frequencies. It would be like if four people strolled in with attached earlobes. Would that change our numbers? Yes, sir. That's gene flow. Or if four people left that have attached earlobes, that would change our numbers. I talked about this yesterday, didn't I? Yes. Let me just go back over it quickly to refresh everyone's memory. If mutation happens, that can change your numbers. If somebody mutated where they're supposed to have attached earlobes, but instead they have hanging, that'll change your numbers. If selection happens, that'll change your numbers. What if the only ones that were able to live were people that had attached earlobes? That would change your numbers, right? The hanging earlobes all die? Didn't I talk yesterday? What if the, a monster came into the room that only ate people with attached earlobes? Think that would change our numbers? Would there be a way for anyone to have pain earlobes? Again? That's a great question, Mary Joy. If all the people with attached earlobes died, there would be, and let me show you how. This person right here is a heterozygote. Oh, yeah. And if they made it with another heterozygote, there's a chance that those two little E's could get together and you gotta, they could have a hanging earlobe kid. Isn't that cool? So, so that could happen. Yes? Um, what? Just the question, it would also affect our numbers if like um, people with hanging earlobes had a way to defend themselves against a monster that only ate them. That's correct. Yeah. And so maybe the hanging earlobes would go up and maybe the, uh, the attached earlobes would go down faster if what you're saying is correct. If they had a way to defend themselves better. If there's major differences between hanging earlobes and non-hanging earlobes, we might see that in the resulting population. And I talked yesterday about the Amish. Did yeah. I talk about them? Yeah. See, the Amish have extra fingers. Did you read about why that was? Well, it's um, founders. Count the fingers. Six. One too many. What they usually do with a person with ex born with extra fingers is they'll cut it off. Yeah, this. Wait, can you? That's what your dad does, right? Yeah, he cuts baby's toes off. Cuts baby's toes off. Wait, wait, so can you use that extra have... finger? No, Most of them can't use it very well. This is sex skin. Do they have yeah. two thumbs or two pinkies? I don't know. <laughs> that one has two pinkies. What? Do they all look like that? Do you have six fingers? Not necessarily, no. Yeah, it could be. Oh, do they work? <laughs> Usually not. They don't work well. So why is why are the Amish this way? Here's why. The Amish people were founded by 200 people that came to America that said we're going to be Amish, and they they had a rule is they couldn't marry outside their religion. And one of those 200 people had an extra finger gene. And since they could only marry within their religion, that guy got married, he had a bunch of kids, and all his kids carried his gene. And those kids married within their religion, and all their kids carried the gene. And so because they don't marry outside their religion, there's a high prevalency of that mutation in that population. We call that the founder effect. Because they founded the population, and their genetics were a little different, then their whole population now is a little different. So then wouldn't mostly everyone be related to everyone? Yeah. To some That's extent, really yeah. That's weird. A little bit to of some incest. extent. Yeah. Oh, God. That's nasty. Yeah, they're all kind of Let's talk about speciation now. Just like that. Just like Speciation <laughs> is when a new species forms. How does it happen? Well, there's two main ways speciation can happen. We call this type on the left allopatric speciation. Can you say allopatric speciation? Allopatric speciation. 
speciation. Nice, some good ones. Allopatric speciation is when a population gets separated. Sometimes it's by mountains, sometimes it's by a canyon, sometimes it's by an ocean. In this example, there's a canyon that forms. It separates this original population into two. And what ended up happening was the ones on this side of the canyon changed and became lighter in color. The ones on this side stayed the same. Why did they become lighter in color on this side? I don't know. It could happen for a number of reasons. Could be just a mutation came in one of them. And it dropped a bunch of seeds and then all of its uh, babies grew up and eventually they, for some reason, they might grow a little bit faster, a little bit better. Maybe they do photosynthesis a little better because of their lighter color. And they end up taking over over thousands or millions of years they take over on that side. But that mutation never happened on this side. So these stayed what they were. And now we have two separate species. That's a speciation event. Yes? Couldn't they both have mutations? They could. They could. And this side could have, if this side got the same mutation, then you would, they wouldn't but form a new species. Different. But if they could have a different species, then maybe they become even darker green, or maybe they become red or something like that. That could happen too. So we call that allopatric speciation. Do you want to see video footage of allopatric yes, speciation? <coughs> this is kind of a funny video. It's about a it's about a um, fictional species. Did that cause humans? Or that, is that a theory? Yeah, we're going to talk about human evolution in two chapters, and uh, we'll we'll go over that. Maybe it might be three chapters. Speciation of ligers and bats. Tribes. There was another one named Dikembe Mutombo. He used to play for the Hawks. 
He was also from one of those African tribes. They're real tall and skinny, and that's an evolutionary adaptation to a hot environment. So they just drafted from out of the Yeah. Well, he, he, he made himself available to the NBA. He, he put himself in the draft. Um, so, it's called allopatric speciation when something separates the two groups. I went hiking in the, at the Grand Canyon a couple of summers ago, and you can see it on the south side of the Grand Canyon. There is a species of squirrels that's kind of dark color. And on the north side of the Grand Canyon, there's a different species of squirrels that's a little bit lighter colored. It's exactly what happened here. They used to be one species, but they got separated. And there's no way to get across the canyon now. Would that kind of be like, I went to Wisconsin a couple years ago, and all the squirrels there were really big. They were like, oh, were they? normally oh, big. Fox squirrels. That's, uh, that's probably a different species of squirrel. Yeah. And they certainly all came from some original species of squirrel. So yeah, yeah. Now, it doesn't have to happen where there's something separating the two groups. It shows in this picture what we call sympatric speciation. Can you say sympatric speciation? speciation? That's when a new species forms, but there's no separation between the groups. Perhaps one of these trees came up with a mutation that makes it lighter colored and maybe able to do photosynthesis a little bit better. And it drops a bunch of seeds and a bunch more trees grow that are like it. And all of a sudden you have a new species here in the same area where the, the old species is. And that can happen. It's called sympatric speciation. It's, a, it's probably a little less frequent, but it still can happen. Yes? So eventually, if the new species was more adept at surviving than the old species, the old species would be it could it could run them out, yeah, it could, yeah. But very likely, um, if this is a new species, the old species might have spread a long ways, and it might be hard for the new species to get everywhere where the old species went. So what's probably more likely is that you've got two species now that are both existing. One's in one location, one's in another location. But it could happen, like you're saying, too. One could go extinct. Have you ever heard of a mule? Yes, sir. A mule is a sterile hybrid between two species. Horse and a donkey. If you mate a horse and a donkey, <coughs> you get a mule. And let me show you how this works. At one time, a long time ago, there was a type of animal, we call it a perissodactyl, And that perissodactyl evolved on one branch into the horse and evolved on a different branch into the donkey. And there used to be just one species, but now there's two. And, um, but the horse and the donkey are different species, but if they do, if they do mate with one another, they can have a baby, a mule. But the thing about the mule is, that mule is sterile. That mule cannot have kids. And so the horse and the donkey, they're closely enough related where they can mate, but they have a sterile hybrid offspring called a mule. Farmers like mules because they're real tame and uh, they're easy to, um, they're not too wild or anything like that. And they can carry a lot of stuff around. So farmers like to use mules. Um, for for work as work animals. The boat in the background. Yeah. Oh, shipwreck. is that a shipwreck in the background? I think they're like scavenging. Oh, I see. Yeah, I don't know where that picture came from. Like, Africa, maybe. maybe. Yeah, could be. This is called a post-zygotic isolating mechanism, and what that means is there's two types of isolation. There's pre-zygotic and there's post-zygotic. Now. If we look at this, at this evolutionary tree, branching off earlier on this same line is, 
trying to think of another perissodactyl. I want to say... Zebra? Yeah, let's... No, let's not do a zebra. That's a good, that's a good example, though. But a zebra can mate with a horse. I want something that can't mate with a horse. A zebra and a horse. You know what a zebra and a horse make? A zorse. A zorse. Have you ever seen a zorse? No. Google a zorse and look at a picture of a zorse. Um, a camel? Is a camel a person? Yeah, it says a rhino. Is a rhino. Okay, let's use rhino. That'd be kind of strange. A Good. rhino? Yeah. I have an armored stallion. A rhino is also a perissodactyl. That would be great so to have. So a tapir. Yeah, well, let's, let's just use rhino. That's a good example. So, listen to this. In the evolution of these animals, the rhino evolved much earlier. And it is so different that if a rhino tried to mate with a donkey, it wouldn't form anything. Or if a rhino tried to mate with a horse, it wouldn't form anything. And here's why. If the sperm of a rhino tried to get into the egg of a horse, it couldn't penetrate the egg. And it wouldn't even form anything. The, the the horse would never get pregnant in this weird mating of a rhino and a horse that probably wouldn't occur anyway because the rhino's not attracted to the horse in the first place. But um, these cannot mate and even form anything because there's such great differences between the sperms and eggs. We call differences between sperms and eggs that doesn't even allow uh, a zygote to form, we call that prezygotic isolating mechanism. But if they can form a sterile offspring like a mule, we call it post-zygotic isolating mechanism. Somebody had a question? Yes, yeah, Sam. So yeah, we looked up zorts and uh -huh. we found a picture of a donkey. Donkey. Okay. That's a that's a, a a donkey and a zebra. A donkey. It's also sterile, isn't it? Uh, Sam is a sterile hybrid. I don't know. I only see a picture. Uh -huh. You might want to look it up. A zebroid. Zebroid is a zebra and a horse. Have you ever heard of a liger? Yes. yes. A liger is if a lion mates with a tiger. Lions and tigers are close enough together where they can have a sterile offspring. It's called a liger. Ligers are actually bigger than lions or tigers. They're real, but they're sterile. That's the biggest cat, a liger. Liger is the biggest cat. Oh my god. The biggest cat is a liger. It's also bred for uh, magic. Well, in that. Uh, Napoleon Dynamite's favorite. That's why I thought it was fake. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, real. Three of my favorite animals. Let's move on. Is it your favorite? I kind of want. Yeah, ligers would be cool. You never find ligers in nature because lions live in Africa and tigers live in Asia, so they never they never mate. The only time they mate is in a is in a zoo or something like that. We want to talk about what adaptive radiation means. Can you say adaptive radiation? Adaptive radiation. All at the same time? Adaptive radiation. That's when one organism, like this early perissodactyl, evolves into many. This happened, this happens all over the place. A good example is on the Galapagos. An original finch came to the Galapagos Islands probably several of them in a, in a flock that got blown away by a storm. Some finches came to the Galapagos Island millions of years ago, and depending on what island they ended up on, evolved into different types of finches. We call that an adaptive radiation, just like this drawing I have up here. One thing evolves into many things. Um, William said a tapir is another example of a perissodactyl. Early perissodactyls evolved into all the different types of hooved um, animals that we have today. Early finches evolved into all the types of finches we have today. Early cats evolved into all the different types of cats we have now. We call this adaptive radiation. And what it means is, the way life works, it looks like a tree where you start with very few organisms and you end up with a lot of different types. We call these evolutionary trees. And you're going to see them and look at them and we're going to work with them over the next few chapters.
Humans have their own evolutionary tree. And we're going to study that in a few chapters. We're the only one left that survived, though. You know what? how you draw it if something goes extinct? You draw a branch like this, and you draw a boop. That means it went extinct. Not even it didn't make it all the way. This is today. A lot of things don't make it all the way to present. So you don't put the name if they're extinct? Oh, yeah, you can put the name. I just don't know the name of extinct perissodactyls, but I'm sure there are a bunch. Um, actually, I do know the name of one. Hiracotherium. Yeah. Aha! Uh -huh. Hiracotherium is the horse? little extinct horse that was about this big. Wouldn't it be great to have a horse that big? They have horses that big. Come here. Shetland Pony. Oh, not as big, not, not, <laughs> not as small as the, as the uh, Hiracotherium. They were real small. Um, okay, the last thing I want to talk about are analogous structures. Let's look at these three organisms. That's a pterodactyl. Have you heard of those? Like the big flying dinosaurs? That's a bat. And that's a bird. And they all have wings. So you might look at this and go, oh, these are all closely related. But it's an illusion, William. It's an illusion. Pterodactyl wings evolved completely separately from bat wings, which evolved completely separately from bird wings. All three of these came from organisms that, that just had arms that evolved wings on their own. As a matter of fact, wings have evolved many, many times in the animal kingdom. Fish evolved wings, flying fish. Insects evolved wings. There's lots of things that evolved wings. So just because these all have wings doesn't mean they're related. If we run into that situation where organisms look the same, but they aren't actually closely related, we call these structures analogous structures. It's different than the homologous structures we saw earlier when we talked about bone structure. Let me go back. Ah, oh, it's from a different chapter. Do you remember the homologous structures, like the bone structures yes. of the arms and, and leg bones of different animals were the same? We call it analogous structures. Look at this. Look what a shark looks like, and an ichthyosaur looks like, and a porpoise looks like. Don't they all look kind of the same? Yes. But they're not related to one another. The porpoise came from a land mammal, the ichthyosaur came from a land reptile, and the shark came from a fish. And they all live differently, but they all had to evolve that shape because that's the shape you need to live in the water. It's the most advantageous that's shape. The yeah, that's the best shape to have. You can't really do well in the water without being that shape. So things tend to evolve to look like that if they swim around in the water. And we call that convergent evolution. And all these fins that you see, they're called analogous structures because they're similar looking. But that doesn't mean they came from the same thing, analogous structures. So you need to read about all this. Make sure you do your reading tonight. And uh, it's chapter 27. There could be a quiz on that on Monday. We good? Any other questions or problems?